you, Dirk, and also thank you, Rafi, for a very um, broad architecture, you know, setting the framework for, for today's debate. Um, and uh, I will bring in my talk, uh, these 10 minutes, my personal experience and the case study, which I hope is complement to Rafi's uh, um, framework. Um, I have to confess that I come to this field much later than Rafi and Chris. Um, I have to say I'm more like a newcomer to the field of China-African studies. And uh, I started to notice this phenomenon and uh, very much interested um, um, and uh, <coughs> would like to, to explore more. When we uh, see the China-African uh, trade economic relationship soaring very fast, and also Chinese direct investment uh, going to Africa also increase uh, very fast. We hear from the media, uh, read from lots of uh, newspapers, magazines, and the reports uh, about various views about China's economic engagement and the presence in Africa. Uh, so I have a lot of questions in my mind. I hear like Chinese uh, imports are crowding out the uh, African uh, small and medium enterprises. Um, I would like to find out, you know, what is the, is this true? And uh, why is this? And also I hear about uh, China's um, direct investment multinationals going to Africa mainly driven by the state, probably so the state strategic driven and going to Africa seeking for resources and turning Africa into um, a resource uh, driven economy. So also I would like to find out whether this is true, what's, what's the, 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 the motivation and what is the impact. So all these questions come to me. And uh, actually in my, uh, what I have done is I have done uh, case study field work and large scale uh, surveys in both Africa and in China, try to understand the motivations, the behavior, the impact at different level, at different level. And actually, I found there are really, there are quite a few misconceptions and which do not match the realities. And there are a lot of unanswered questions. <coughs> That is why I found this DFID ESRC core really will, I hope it will help us to find out more truth through uh, academic, rigorous academic research and also find uh, the lessons for others, for other uh, rising powers, for other African economies and also for China itself <coughs> for the future. Uh, that, that is one aspect. And the other aspect is about, I also uh, hear a lot about um, China's experience and uh, the China model and uh, whether this China model, chi China's success experience can be repeated in Africa. And when I went to Africa to do field work, I, I he heard people talking about whether, you know, we can, we, we learn from China and especially to talking about the state capitalism, talking about the d developmental state. Uh, also, that is, I have concerns about this. That's why, where I have this great passion to work on this. Because nowadays, looking at China, China is launching another round of reforms to deepen the reforms, deepen the marketization. So people in China are learning the, the lessons and the correcting the mistakes and the want to marketize deepen the marketization. Well, you know, some people may be s s still with the goodwill telling the African countries, you know, learning from China, from the, the state-led model, well, without recognize all the negative sides and, uh, and the uh, disorders caused by the state-led model. Uh, and uh, the would like, uh, want to replicate this state-led model in Africa and uh, uh, in Africa, especially when they have a more fragile state, more fragile state. Um, sometimes I would think, hang on, you know, this will push Africa probably to the direction which we would not, would not like to see. Um, so that's why I, I think looking at the, the ESRC uh, and DFID core, I, I feel, you know, all the questions that they, they have raised 
uh, you know, from to understand the role of the local government, China's uh, impact on Africa through trade, through foreign direct investment, and the role of special economic zones, all those Rafi has uh, uh, mentioned are also relevant and uh, relevant for us to uh, deeply understand, especially uh, if we probe not only the macro picture, but also under the radar to see the multi-level uh, 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 responses and also to, to, um, to see different uh, contexts, different contexts. Um, and uh, my own um, expertise is uh, about China's economic uh, uh, interaction with Africa, so about trade, about foreign direct investment. And uh, so what I start is to looking at how China's trade and the direct investment, trade with and the, and the direct investment in Africa will impact on African economic growth and local capabilities building, especially through some indirect effect, which is technology transfer, which is technology transfer. So these uh, two diagrams just show, I think many of you may, may be very familiar with it. This diagram showing the, the, the growth of China-African uh, trade uh, relationship in both imports and exports. We, we, we see it despite the, the global crisis, it's growing very fast. And uh, so is uh, China's direct investment in Africa. And uh, uh, Africa is now the third largest destination uh, um, uh, uh, globally. Um, um, Excluding um, those, you know, Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan, and excluding Virgin Islands and the Cayman Islands, and uh, excluding this kind of um, 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 tax heaven uh, type of uh, 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 investment, um, the rest of Asia, Europe, and the third comes Africa, uh, which are the largest de destination for China. Uh, and uh, try. As, um, as I have mentioned, I would like to understand, you know, whether China's direct investment, um, especially in Africa, are driven by the state, and whether the firms are really, they behave as an agent for the state, for the government. So what I have done is I have done a survey in China, asking the firms, asking the firms in Guangdong, asking the firms in Guangdong, and uh, what we have found out is the firms saying that they're going to Africa, going to the developing countries for market, uh, for low cost, uh, and for, uh, and, uh, and for um, uh, uh, acquisition of resources, and also to benefit from host country prefer preferential policy, which is distinctly different from Chinese direct investment going to the developed country market like uh, Europe and the US. When I see this pattern of answer, of motivation, of course this is a survey from Guangdong province which is uh, one of the, the, the most marketized region in China. Then I think Look at this multinational, Chinese multinationals in the, in, in the developing country. They are very much similar, their motivation, very much similar to the OECD country traditional multinational going to China. So they seek for various motiv uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, objectives, for resources, for market, for efficiency, and for preferential uh, uh, policy and, uh, and uh, uh, policy, the benefits pr uh, from preferential policy. So it's very much like their behavior of these more market-driven uh, uh, multinationals from China. They, their behavior is much more similar to the traditional OECD uh, uh, developed country uh, uh, multinationals. And uh, what I want to say from here is there are many China here like Rafi has said, different regions and the different level, different ownership of these multinationals, they have different motivation and they may behave differently. This acti act actually showing this. There are state-owned large resource companies going to Latin America or Africa, but also there are so much non-state controlled, non-state owned firms, they behave very much 
in a market-driven way, like the traditional uh, 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 multinationals from UK, from uh, Europe, from the US. So when we carry out the analysis, I think the reality and of motivation and the behavior and the impact are very complex, and we need to, you know, uh, uh, really take into account of this complexity of many China uh, 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 and the many Africa too, and the many of the, uh, uh, many African country too. Now, I also want to uh, um, share you with some of my experience. I guess many of you in the audience may like me. Um, you may. Uh, move into <coughs> this area in recent years rather than you know lifelong in this area. So um, I have carried out um, uh, uh, um, a research which is funded by ESRC and the DFIT on the diffusion of innovation in low-income countries. One of the main research questions is to look at the knowledge diffusion from the multinationals to local firms in Africa. We through a case study in Ghana. And uh, we compare the Chinese multinationals with, uh, versus the traditional multinationals. So what we do is we carry out case study to understand the context, understand the, 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 the process, and also use these insight, insights to inform the firm level, uh, large firm level survey, because we cannot just replicate the standard surveys that we have done in Europe or in, in emerging markets just uh, um, uh, for Africa. And in order to do this, from the, the research design stage, we try to engage <coughs> with uh, local partners, engage with lo um, uh, local um, uh, country uh, government policymakers, <coughs> and also international organization um, policymakers in the international organizations. And therefore, we try to co-design and co-produce uh, this research. Uh, and uh, actually now, we are in the middle of the, uh, the project, and I benefit a lot from the strong support of the local uh, partner. Without their support, the case study, the survey, would not carry out as successful as we had today. And they also give a lot of insights. Uh, about how to design, how to, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, um, the sampling framework uh, and also the, the local assistant, even s uh, interviews. So this is what I have uh, done in this project. And uh, um, there are some lessons so far we have found from, from the, 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 the research. And again, again, I want to echo, you know, uh, to my point earlier about uh, the complexity and also a lot of misconception, etc. And uh, I, I would like to share my story, some of my experience. Uh, in the in the research, we need to choose some of the the, uh, the, the case study industries for the case study. And uh, <coughs> first, we think about the industry technology, knowledge intensive industries. So telecommunication, China, Chinese firms like Huawei has uh, significant uh, presence in Ghana. It could be a good case study. And uh, however, at that moment, when I designed it, I thought, from the literature, it seems Chinese firms are, are not engaged, you know, employ the Chinese in Africa. They don't use local supplier. I guess, especially in this high-tech sector, there will be very limited linkages. That is why I didn't choose that one. And uh, with consultation, we choose construction, because this is a sector has great presence in, in, in Afri many African countries, uh, Chinese presence in many African countries, and a lot of interactions. Uh, however, when we went to the field, the first thing, what people in Ghana will, uh, were asking me, why not choosing a uh, telecommunication sector? Why not Huawei? Uh, I told them we thought probably this high-tech sector couldn't find much local interaction, local supplier. Therefore, we, we think construction sector, they may have local supplier, local subcontractor, et cetera, and the local workers more easily to establish the linkage. And uh, then people tell me, you know, even in Ghana, there's 60% of the employees in Ghana, uh, Huawei Ghana uh, subsidiary, were local Ghanaians. So 60% of the employees are local workers, rather than what we thought would be, you know, a large proportion, maybe 90% uh, are Chinese working in, in, in Ghana, uh, uh, in Huawei, Ghana, but actually 60% are local firms. So this is the first misconception. 
uh, uh, I found that uh, uh, I made before. And also, through the case study of the construction sector, what we find is there are variations of uh, knowledge diffusion and knowledge transfer at different levels and, uh, and uh, through different channels. Uh, we found at the management top level, there were limited knowledge di diffusion. Why? As we, we, we show you the comparison, these two t uh, tables, maybe you cannot see very clearly now, is the Chinese firms at management level, they use much more Chinese managers. While the non-Chinese uh, multinational in the con construction sector, most of them use local managers. So this learning interaction is different. However, at the employee level, look at the firm size. The Chinese construction firms are more than 1,000, 2,000 employees. And uh, uh, there are majority still are local workers. Well, in the, uh, uh, in the non-Chinese multinational construction firms, what we found, their size are much smaller. They're kind of 400, 600. So the employment effect is different. And also Chinese firms, although in the <coughs> management level they use a lot of Chinese, they also have a lot of Chinese workers there. But in terms of absolute number of employees, they still have lo uh, employed a lot of local workers there. Um, therefore, the interaction, the actual interaction still, uh, you know, of training experience still substantial. The Ghanaian uh, uh, workers told me, I was a farmer before, and now I worked in the construction company. I learned how to use contractor. I know how to use lots of uh, construction machines. Now I'm a skilled worker. So at this level, then we see the knowledge uh, uh, gaining. So, um, and also in the supply chain uh, uh, sector, what we found is in Ghana, the, the, the plastic industry grown very fast in recent years. And we interviewed the firms. We asked them whether they learned from Chinese firms. Um, they said no, because uh, whether they are uh, threatened by Chinese competition, they said no. Because they said the PVC pipes is very big, very heavy, and the transportation cost is high, and therefore Chinese imports is not a, a, a threat for us because the transportation cost is high. But they said, we've grown very fast because of the trans expansion of, of the construction <coughs> sector and the demand for our products is uh, growing, and we grow fast. So uh, what I want to show is through this case study to show the in reality, the the effect are mixed, are mixed. There is an, uh, no one for all answer. We need to really look at different me uh, transmission mechanism, look at different levels, interaction, uh, and uh, find out the, 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 the uh, uh, truth. Uh, that's all for, uh, from my experience. Yeah. Uh, thank Great. you. Thank you very much, Charlon. So many Chinas, many differentiated impacts, many different me uh, transmission mechanisms. Very good. Um,